Hello Curious Minds, I'm Miles Maxer and welcome back to the Ant Network. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Corey Moreau, who is the Director of Integrative Research at the Field Museum in Chicago. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure, so as you mentioned, I'm the Director of Research at the Field Museum, um, but I'm also an entomologist, so my specialty is studying the evolution of ants and their gut-associated microbes. So one of the things I'm trying to figure out is why there are so many species of ants, why they're found where they are, and how can they sort of take advantage of every ecological niche and food available. And sometimes it looks like what they're relying on is gut bacteria to help facilitate their ability to eat these really interesting diets. How did you become interested in entomology? Why do you love ants so much? I love ants because I grew up in New Orleans and I always loved nature, but there wasn't a lot of nature in the city. So of course I could see squirrels and I could see, you know, pigeons, but there were bugs everywhere. And I loved bugs. I loved all bugs, but one of the things I loved about ants is that if you found one ant, you knew you were going to find more. So unlike beetles, which I might find the most beautiful beetle I'd ever seen, I didn't know if I'd ever see that beetle again that year. It might not be till next year I found another one. Where with ants, I could find them anywhere. As soon as you found one, you knew you had more to come. And you could sort of watch their behaviors in a way that you can't always do with all other insects. And so whether it was putting out you know, cookie crumbs to see who came to the bait or whether it was watching different colonies battle on the sidewalks for territorial control, I could actually watch them sort of behaving right there in the nature of my own backyard. So you were mentored by Dr. E.O. Wilson at Harvard. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to work with uh, such a world-renowned myrmecologist? First thing I'll say is he's amazing and he's got a brilliant mind. He's got a memory unlike anyone I've ever met. And um, not just for ant facts, but of course he's got that repertoire as well. But he's just as nice in person as he seems on in the books you read or on the things you see on TV. Uh, of course, when I first started working with him, I was incredibly intimidated. So I would often not speak for whole meetings. We used to meet weekly, and I would sit sort of very upright in the chair with my back not touching, um, thinking there's nothing I could say that he didn't already know. Um, but that pretty quickly changed, and so now it's, he teases me at times that, like, don't get Corey started talking about ant evolution or we're going to be here a while. Montana State University just celebrated our 125th year as Montana's land-grant institution with the theme that our work is in the people's interest. How does ant research benefit the public? Well, ant research benefits the public in multiple ways. I mean, of course, there's always the applied aspect of it. And so although ants aren't necessarily crop pests or don't necessarily cause large amounts of human health concerns, there are times that that, in fact, happens. So with things like crop pests, Although they don't destroy plants, they tend, to, they tend to the sap-sucking insects that can cause a lot of issues. But mostly I would say what we benefit from, as far as research goes, is our knowledge and growth of basic research. So it doesn't have to have an applied aspect, but just understanding the natural world and how it's put together benefits us all. And it may not be that we see the direct benefit immediately, but sometimes those you know, little pieces of information that we learn along the way by studying the biology of organisms has big payoffs and whether it's understanding community assembly or how do we keep ecosystems alive and healthy or how is it that we have certain organisms that are keystone species. And so I would argue that ants are keystone species in many ecosystems. In fact, they turn more soil than earthworms. And so if we want healthy soil, we need ants. How do you and your team connect outreach and teach the public about ants? I'm really fortunate that I'm in a natural history museum, and so part of our mission is to educate the public about the work we're doing. So we have a great opportunity to go right down to the public floor and share some of our research, which we do often. But we also get to sort of work with classrooms by bringing our science into the K-12 through classroom. We have a whole suite of undergraduate interns that come to the museum. We have about 120 summer interns every summer that flood into the field museum to do research of some sort or another so that they can take it back to their home institutions. So there's lots of opportunities for engagement. I also try to participate in podcasts or in um, YouTube videos whenever possible to be able to share the work we do. Well, fantastic. And that kind of leads into our next question. How can ant enthusiasts be involved in citizen science? How can they contribute to our study of ants? That's a great question. So one of the things they can do is sort of be documenting the biodiversity in their own backyards. Um, one of the things we don't really know a lot about are where species are distributed, right? And we want to know something about what they're doing in their own you know, environments. 
careful studies of what the biology is, what they're feeding on, where do they nest, how large do their colony sizes get. All of that would be very valuable data that a lot of scientists don't have the time to investigate, but it's critical, especially if you're going to be keeping these ants in your own home, right? So if you're sort of rearing them, that's the basic information you guys already need, and it's a place where we're lacking in those data. What advice do you have for young people who want to become an entomologist, who want to become myrmecologists? I would say that keep in mind there's many ways to be an entomologist or myrmecologist. So clearly there's the research path, like the one that I'm on, where you become a curator or professor. Of course, there's the applied side, where maybe you work for the USDA or maybe even for pest control companies. But there's lots of ways to be engaged in insect-associated science, from things like biotech through you know, keepers in zoos. I mean, there's a lot of jobs that rely on entomology, and I think we often forget just how diverse those jobs can be. So really figuring out what is your passion and sort of pursuing that. What is the most fascinating thing that you have witnessed while doing field work? Oh, wow. Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think it's not one thing. You know, being a, a lover of nature, there's so many opportunities for these sort of awe-inspiring moments in the field. And so whether it was the first time seeing leafcutter ants in the wild, I mean, that was like just amazing to me, or the first time I saw, you know, the silk weaving ants building their nests, those were shocking to me, but it's also sometimes seeing things like, you know, monkeys in the trees, I mean, it's in, you know, finding these flowering plants that make these flowers that you've only ever seen on, you know, nature shows, I, I think there's many awe-inspiring moments, I think probably one of my favorite moments is in the field, is when you get the opportunity to take students with you, and seeing it all again through a fresh lens of their eyes and just how excited they get, it brings you back to the first time you saw it. Here's another one that we had submitted by uh, an ant enthusiast, and they wanted to know, what is the, your dream ant species to have in like a display at your home? Oh, your wow. Home? Okay, so I would tell you that my favorite ant in the world is probably not the most charismatic for keeping in your home, but um, maybe you guys can think of exciting ways to display them. Um, so I love the turtle ants. In particular, I love the Florida Keys turtle ant, which is Cephalodes variants. And it's where they're, they have two casts within the colony. They have small workers and they have large-headed majors. And they have these sort of disc-shaped heads that they use to block nest entrances of the hollow twigs they live in. So for display purposes, all you see is a hollow twig and a hole and then a black dot. But to know that there's an ant standing there as a stopper is quite remarkable, while the whole rest of the colony is functioning within the hollow twig, and that she'll only move out of the way when the nest mates come that have the right chemical signals, right? And then she'll move out of the way. So I would love to have that display. But at the same time, I'm equally aware of things like the honeypot ants, how charismatic they are to keep just because they're oh, so remarkable and hard to believe that that's still an ant with this really swollen abdomen. So. I don't know, there's lots of cool ants to display. You often help to instruct the California Academy of Sciences ant course. What is it and who should apply? The ant course is actually an opportunity for people to gain hands-on knowledge about ant biology in a more structured environment. Uh, oftentimes it's that you have the opportunity to learn about insect or ant taxonomy, about ant identification, ant curation, how to do ecological experiments in the field, how to think about evolutionary questions across the diversity of ants. Typically, the people who apply are graduate students who are working on research related to ants, but may not have the resources or the knowledge at their home institutions. So maybe they don't have an ant, you know, myrmecologist in their own department, but they really want to conduct research. We also often get um, professors who want to incorporate ants into their research programs. We've had undergraduates come into the course as well who are clearly on the path to being able to incorporate ants into some capacity of research in their careers as well. So I would say there's lots of opportunity there. We've even had amateur ant enthusiasts um, participate in the course. Now that you're settled in at the Field Museum, what does your everyday work day look like? It depends on where I am. So my work day, uh, when I'm in the museum, it can be filled with meetings with students and postdocs or answering lots of email. It can be analyzing data that we've generated in our molecular genetics laboratory. 
but I actually still have a very active field component, so I try to spend quite a bit of time every year in the tropics, actually out collecting these species of ants, seeing what they do in nature, designing experiments where I can test the questions I'm interested in. So it could be anywhere from the hot, sweaty tropics to you know, interacting with eight-year-olds to share the research we do on the public floor to you know, being able to supervise graduate students. So Dr. Moreau, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I think one thing to keep in mind is that studying ants, whether it's in a sort of more rigid research arena or whether it's observing them because you're just passionate about them, they're both valuable and they're both important and that not everyone should be an ant researcher and not everyone is an enthusiast who wants to know how to rear ants at home, but it, they're equally valuable. So knowing what your own interests are and where they you know, lie and where they can take you is incredibly important. I mean, I have some really close friends who do things like run insect zoos, right? Or, you know, maybe they actually work in biotech but have been able to incorporate what they know about insect diversity into the research they're doing. So there's many ways to, to sort of share that information and make meaningful contributions. So just keep loving ants. I just want to thank Dr. Corey Moreau again for sitting down with us to talk about ants, her career, and what it's like to be a marine ecologist in the 21st century. Also, we want to congratulate her on a fantastic new position at Cornell University. It's super exciting. Hopefully we hear from her soon. If you enjoyed this interview and other content from the Ant Network, please like and subscribe, and don't forget to share with your friends. Thank you so much for watching.